I am delighted to be with a group of people who are so interested in uh, entrepreneurialism in its kind of broadest um, manifestation. I have spent my whole career in the nonprofit sector. And so I, I'm going to talk to you about what I think of as the application of being an entrepreneur in, in a nonprofit setting. And it's not easy. Um, as Tom said, I was at the Nature Conservancy as president for almost, almost eight years. Prior to that, I was working with the Nature Conservancy in California uh, for 16 years. Um, so I spent most of my career in the nonprofit sector at a more or less typical NGO, typical in the sense that it's dependent on private contributions, carries out a very focused mission, um, and employs people who have a deep, passionate interest in that mission and, and have an alignment around that. I went to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation in 2008, very beginning of 2008. <laughs> and after having spent almost 30 years trying to raise money, going to a foundation that has $6 billion in assets, it was sort of like getting into the vault. Um, and I, I joked with people the first day I was there, I said, can I, can I actually go look at the money? I mean, is it is kind of piled up somewhere? And is it, um, but it, 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 it's, it's a sort of commonplace outlook in the NGO community that nothing could be easier than working at a foundation. It was very hard to raise money. And how hard could it be to give money away? Um, there's some truth in that, but I'm going to share with you a lot of the lessons I've learned about the difficulty of giving money away. Although I, I will share with you uh, an insight I had when I started there. Because again, coming from an organization with a $500 million operating budget at the Nature Conservancy, and then a need to raise at least that much in capital contributions every year, because as many of you may know, the Nature Conservancy buys land. My biggest challenge, the thing that really kept me anxious, was getting that money in every year, raising enough money. Um, and any nonprofit leader will tell you that. It's just like, it's just every year you're just fixated on getting enough money in. So when I started the foundation and asked folks, like, what's the, what, what causes anxiety here? What do, you, what do you kind of like really get worried about? And the response was, oh man, at the end of the year, we've got to hit our 5% payout. That's not easy. So what you're telling me is you worry about getting money out the door. Yeah, that's unbelievable. That was a, a, a mindset that I hadn't anticipated um, and actually was an insight into some of the um, challenges, frankly, of, of running a big foundation. So um, I'm going to share perspectives from both of those roles. Um, and some things are very similar and some things are very d distinct. But I'd say overall, um, managing a big enterprise um, in the not-for-profit sector, in the for-profit sector, in the government sector has a lot of similarities. And I believe that one of the most important characteristics of leadership in the nonprofit sector is one of entrepreneurialism. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. One of the biggest challenges in the nonprofit world is understanding how well you're doing. So in a for-profit, there are conventions consistently uh, applied, universally understood, often legally required, that enable leadership or anybody in a large enterprise, or small enterprise for that matter, to know how well they're doing. And, and typically those are financial metrics. In a nonprofit organization, you don't have any consistency in the metrics to determine success or progress towards a mission. And frankly, one of the biggest shortcomings of nonprofit organizations is that they begin to think of success in terms of tactics and activities, not end results. I have an almost obsessive focus 
on outcomes. And I always have. I remember when I started at the Nature Conservancy, which again has been characterized by its, I think, very successful tactic of buying land. I started there as a lawyer. Um, and transactions were always in the pipeline, um, negotiated by very able field representatives, typically who had a business degree. I started in 1977. I was 14 years old. <laughs> just kidding. Just, I was really just more or less out of law school. Um, but all these transactions, each one of which was a very fine consequence in its own right, I, c I couldn't see how, how does it add up? How, how is this individual transaction contributing to some larger outcome? And in as much as the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to preserve, in essence, this is a little bit of a simplification, the diversity of life on Earth. It seems like it would be a lot of transactions to get enough diversity of life on Earth to satisfy our mission. So I'd say, you know, in any enterprise that you go into, large or small, keep your eye on the ball. What is this enterprise all about? What do I want to accomplish? And if I'm in a leadership role or if I'm in an entrepreneurial role, what does my compass head towards? What am, what am I trying to get done? And it's so easy. Any of you who've worked in any kind of enterprise realize day to day, the noise can distract you. And you lose sight. And I see that a lot in nonprofit organizations. How many of you have worked for a nonprofit, even as a volunteer? A lot of you, okay. So that means I can't lie too much about my nonprofit. Somebody <laughs> catch me on that. Um, but I think you'd agree, anybody who's worked in a nonprofit, that keeping your eye on the prize is a challenge. Um, again, because in part, it's hard to define what that prize is in, in ways that are simple, understandable, and um, measurable. Another challenge for nonprofit organizations is the, um, candidly, the, the, the culture typically is one of consensus. And in part, I think that's attributable to the ethos, the mindset of like, okay, I have devoted my life to a cause, to a mission that is sort of sanctified by the nonprofit status bestowed by the government on this enterprise. And consciously or unconsciously, people in nonprofit organizations, I think, feel they're a little special because they've sacrificed to go work for a nonprofit at a cause, the cause driven. And that is a very admirable. Um, characteristic. And it is quite true. People who work in nonprofit organizations obviously are there for the cause. And nonprofits typically don't pay as well as a for profit, if you could benchmark. Um, and so, almost unavoidably, or at least I'd say understandably, a culture of a nonprofit very much is like, we're all in this together. And um, therefore, I want to make sure I get to touch every decision. And I, I want to make sure that I'm OK with every decision. And um, if I'm not OK with the decision, I sort of feel a sense of, you know, I, I have legitimacy in like, not aligning with that. My father started and through his whole life ran a very successful business. Engineering, engineering business, as a matter of fact, got his degree at Cal. Um, my father was a great small business leader at that time, in the 50s and 60s. Um, but he very much had the outlook that this is my business, it's my capital in this business, I get to make the decisions. And he was not autocratic. But he didn't tolerate a lot of, well, you know, I don't think I align with that. It's like, you're on the bus or you're off the bus. So nonprofit organizations are challenged by that kind of culture. And I don't say that dismissively or derisively, it's just the reality. So being an entrepreneur in that culture can be a bit of a challenge. 
Uh, candidly, I've looked back on my now 35-year career in the not-for-profit not for profit sector and thought, you know, I'm not sure I really had the patience over all those years <laughs> to deal with that sort of culture. And I've made a lot of mistakes because of that. Because you can't fight that, you've got to work with that. Speed in nonprofits, therefore, is kind of rare. And today, when we live in the VUCA world, V-U-C-A, you familiar with that? It comes out of the military. There's an enterprise nearby, the Institute for the Future. Bob Johansson has done a lot of forecasting there. He uses that term to describe a volatile, uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous world, getting more so. And what's interesting to me is, in many respects, Moore's Law. I'm going to put you on the spot. Anybody not familiar with Moore's Law? I'd be kind of embarrassed to say so. So Gordon Moore, founder of Intel, in 1965 wrote a paper in a now long gone professional journal that described his projection of how fast the speed of microprocessors would, 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 excel, would grow over time and how the cost would come down. And it was, these were exponential curves. In 1965, 1965, now in 1965, I was in eighth grade. I mean, we were still using slide rules. Gordon projected that in 25 years, virtually everybody could afford what, in essence, is a laptop computer, a personal phone, and a number of other things that would come as a result of the application of his law. Um, the extraordinary thing is not only did it last for the period of time that he projected, it's still happening. And interestingly, Moore's law has now become sort of popularized to generically describe the pace of change in society. Uh, so when I came to the foundation, I thought, this is great. You know, I mean, Moore's law, we ought to be able to think maybe there's Moore's second law, how it would apply to the philanthropic sector, the not-for-profit sector. Could we move with speed? It's really challenging. So an entrepreneur in the not-for-profit field has to deal with the paradox of the world moving at a very fast pace, dealing with people who are devoted to a cause, they believe in it passionately, this thing oozes out of their, 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 their pores, and yet kind of stuck in a very consensus-oriented mindset. Now, having said all that, I continue to believe very, very unequivocally that the not-for-profit sector, and I would say even more so, the philanthropic sector is in a position to drive major social change, more so than any other sector in society. But I don't see it stepping up to that just yet. Now, why, why do I say it can, and why do I say that it's not yet? It can, and I'm going to talk about the foundation community. So our foundation has $6 billion in assets. By law, we are required to give out 5% of our asset wealth every year. We can give more, but by law, we're required to give out at least 5%. So that's Stanford students, 5% of $6 billion is $300 million every year. So we turn a spigot on every year, and $300 million comes gushing out, and we can do anything we want with that as long as it's devoted to a philanthropic enterprise. Unbelievable. And I, I could actually, we could burn it. <laughs> and next year, I turn that spigot on, and another $300 million comes out. So we think, wow, if, if that's the case, if I could burn that, and I still have $300 million, and if I want, legally, I could go into the $6 billion and use that. Why don't we shoot for the moon? Only a foundation, or only, I'll say, private charity, has the wherewithal, and actually the legal ability, to think about lasting forever. 
So we're, we're set up in perpetuity. I mean, may, maybe the Catholic Church is the only other thing. It's like they can think in perpetuity. You know, so you think, wow, that's incredible. We can last in perpetuity. We can live forever with $300 million coming out in today's valuation every year to do something great. Why wouldn't we reach for the stars? Interestingly, and I would say quite candidly, I think foundations are among the most conservative actors in society. And why is that? I would assert because, frankly, not enough people with entrepreneurial zeal, a, a, a passion for moving fast, for experimentation, for rapid prototyping, for taking risks and being willing to learn from it, not enough of those kind of people are going to work for foundations. It would be a hugely contributory contribution to society if all of you with your entrepreneurial backgrounds went to work for foundations. You could change the world. And I, I don't mean to cast dispersion on the people who work in foundations, but typically foundations have hired people from academia <coughs> or from NGOs. And they're wonderful people. The people who work at our foundation are fantastic people. Our foundation was built on Gordon Moore's belief that philanthropy should have a strong business <coughs> orientation to it. Meaning, keep your eye on the ball, take risks. Look, he built Intel. Reach for the fences. That's Gordon's phrase, reach for the fences. We're the biggest funder of environmental conservation, which is why I came to the foundation, which is why I knew the foundation. Biggest funder of environmental conservation. Gordon said at the inception of the foundation, he wants to win in the environment rather than lose slowly. Yeah, I love that. So here's an extraordinarily generous man, comes out of a business background, says, OK, I want to do philanthropy, but I want it to be imbued with the best principles of an entrepreneurial enterprise. And in that combination would be, I believe, the key to solving or at least addressing major social problems. Because I also think that today's social problems, you, you don't solve them. They're so complex, you, you know, you, you, we're going to manage them. So foundation has the capability of staying with a really wicked problem for a very long time. Trying things, learning, adjusting, course correcting, learning, adapting in real time. And it has the ability to strike something really fast. When I was at the Nature Conservancy, if an opportunity came along that required significant funding, 10, 20 million dollars, you know, I'd have to go raise that money. And a lot of times the opportunity, if it was something that was like presented, if we could do this with that, with the World Bank, we could drive a change that would completely reorient, say, the, the lending policy of the World Bank. But you'd need some fast mover money out there that was on the table to drive a slower, bigger uh, international institution. Oh, God, you know, I, can't, I that couldn't do that at the Nature Conservancy. The foundation, I can call up our Invest, chief investment officer, nothing prevents me from saying, Denise, would you wire $20 million to this qualifying nonprofit? And yet, our foundation, like many, has encumbered itself with processes to move money out. And I have to tell you, is there anybody here from the Moore Foundation? They, could, they'll be, they may be watching this in the future. So. <laughs> I say this with the greatest respect, and uh, um, we develop processes to move money out the door, and they become an orthodox, an orthodoxy. So, wow, gosh, it you know, takes six money, months to get money out the door. We've got to fill out these forms, and we've got templates that have to be reviewed by lawyers, all imposed on ourselves. And it's hard to strip those things out. When you think about it, Foundations have no incentive to change. There are no external influences that drive a for-profit to respond to changes in customer tastes or demand, supply chain uh, perturbations, 
no external influences that drive a nonprofit organization to think about how it's soliciting, recruiting <coughs> support, and none of the external influences in the form, say, of a legislature that a government agency has to deal with to make sure they get an appropriation every year. No external drivers uh, that impose that sense of urgency and a need to change. I was talking with a consultant not long ago who is um, very well known for his engagement with big business, actually, in driving strategy very fast um, in a rapidly uh, uh, changing external environment. And I've heard him speak, and I admire him enormously. I've read his books, and I said, yeah, I'd love to have you come help me think about how I could position our foundation not as a grant maker, foundation think they make grants, it's like this grant making machine, but as a change maker. And using all the assets of our enterprise, our name, the connections we have, the ability to move fast, the ability to stay with things for a long time, I'd love to have you help me position this foundation as like a, a whole new concept of philanthropy. He said, you know, I've worked with foundations and I'm not gonna do it anymore because they don't want to change. So when I, go to, when I go to work with a CEO at a company, large or small, I ask them, what are the three, maybe five things that you worry about in the next five years that could really disrupt your business? And they start there. And then they work off of that and start thinking about, okay, looking ahead to have foresight to come back to insight so they can take action. He said, foundations, like, I ask them what they're worried about, and it's like job security. It's internal things that they're concerned about. So we're at a point in society, in this country, when philanthropic dollars are increasing at a pace they never have before. We will see more money devoted to philanthropy in the next 10 to 15 years than we've seen in the last 100. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett put a challenge out you may have heard of, called the Giving Pledge. And they asked people of a uh, net worth of a billion dollars or more to make a public pledge that they would give away half of their wealth during their lifetime. And there are upwards of 100 people who have signed up for that. A fair number of them in this community here. <clears throat> you may have seen that Mark Zuckerberg gave $500 million of Facebook stock to the Silicon Valley Community Foundation recently. And these are just examples. The amount of money going into either structured or directed philanthropy is increasing dramatically. So the opportunity for that funding to take on major social problems and drive major change and be a leader is more ripe than ever before. And we are beginning to see some very interesting shifts in how the new philanthropists think. Many, again, are from this area. So you may have heard terms like strategic philanthropy or venture philanthropy, outcome-based philanthropy. But philanthropists thinking in terms of the eye on the prize, how am I gonna measure results? How can I move fast? How can I rapid prototype? How can I learn fast? How can I fail fast? How can I take what I, as an entrepreneur, have turned into something very successful in the private sector into the public sector. And so I think we're, as I say, at the threshold of a kind of a renaissance, a rethinking, a reimagining of how philanthropy can work. And at the same time, we're seeing more nonprofit organizations that rely on that support, realizing that the, the, the characteristics, attributes, assets of of those who are successful in enterprise management are imperative in the not-for-profit world. Not-for-profit world, again, has many people who are drawn to it and they have the cause deep in their gut. Nonprofit leaders are often charismatic, uh, almost dangerously so sometimes, as we've seen, able to attract people to them and raise money, but not so good at making sure that that money is applied in a way that really is driving results. But we're starting to see more of that. And more business schools are seeing the expansion of what's called social enterprise in the business schools. And after all, you think about 
future business schools, I, I, I'm convinced that some days they won't, someday they won't be called business schools. They'll be called maybe enterprise schools. Because the distinction between nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations is going to blur. And I actually think that the not-for-profit sector could benefit enormously, as I said previously, from having people come in with really good leadership skills in, in all their dimensions, but also great management skills, keeping their eye on the prize, measuring whether they're making progress and being willing to adapt. Now, in saying that, I also put out a caution. Nonprofits are not for profits. It is very hard to measure results in a quantitative way in a not for profit organization. And, as the adage goes, what you measure gets managed. If you put emphasis on things that are measurable, you actually may drive organizations to do things that aren't really adding up to the prize. Someone shared with me a little while ago, a guy named Mario Molino, who's, who is a, um, a very successful investor, venture capitalist, who's gotten deeply involved in the art and science and practice of philanthropy, and has advocated for outcome-based philanthropy. He said, you know, you do need to be careful, though, because as we saw in Vietnam, the measure was body count. You, you could count the number of bodies that were the result of a battle. And what happened? We lost in Vietnam. <laughs> we drove all of the field leadership to think in terms of how many bodies did we get in that battle? And we're adding up bodies. But at the, at the time, we, we, we were not we were not, this country was not making progress in the political environment, in the economic environment, in the social environment in Vietnam. And so I had no hope of winning in Vietnam. And the North Vietnamese were willing to keep putting bodies into the body count. S good example, but a sobering example of measuring the wrong thing. So in a not-for-profit setting, Measuring success will require much more nuance, much more subtle ways of assessing progress. More like gathering evidence for a legal case than it is sort of counting something. So that's one, one caution. Another caution is that, especially with the emergence of this new generation of philanthropists who have a, st a very strong grounding in entrepreneurially driven enterprises where they've been inordinately successful, generated a great deal of wealth, um, frankly figure they kind of know how to do almost anything, and see themselves as drivers of change, good thing, but also needed to help nonprofits um, be more sophisticated. And I'll tell you, having worked, again, for a nonprofit organization, the temptation to change what you're focused on in order to get that money is too great. It's, 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 it's overpowering. So as I said, every year I worried about raising enough money for the Nature Conservancy. Now we had a strategy driven towards our mission. We thought it was well <clears throat> conceived. We would sell that. And often I would encounter very wealthy people who would say, well, that's, that's interesting. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this other thing that, you know, was close enough. You know, I was just thinking about that myself. I think, we're, you know, we'll, 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 yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, we're ready to go do that. And I, I, I will confess that more than once I was seduced into getting a big contribution not thinking through the implications, and actually ending up taking on more of a fundraising burden. There was one time when we were working with Caterpillar Corporation, and they had a strong interest in uh, watershed management. We didn't have a lot of experience in watershed management. We had bought land on river corridors. 
But watershed management is a much more complex <laughs> undertaking. And you know, having to understand users of water and um, issues like uh, uh, contamination of water, water rights. Um, but Caterpillar was really interested in that. And they said, well, they'd be willing to put up $15 million. What did I hear? $15 million. So I said, yeah, you know, we were that's where we're headed is watershed management. We're going to take all these properties that we bought, and we're going to figure out how to you know, work in the larger watershed. And we got into it and we realized this is at least a $50 million undertaking. This was on the upper Mississippi River. This is not a small river. <laughs> and, you know, ended up kind of slogging through, but not really living up to what Caterpillar wanted from us. So philanthropists, as entrepreneurs, need to be very thoughtful about the pull that they have on organizations and how they can very profoundly disorient or distract organizations from what they say is their mission. And it's very hard in a nonprofit organization where you're thinking from year to year how you're going to raise money to have a 10-year horizon. It's very hard to have a three-year horizon. You're going to take on a project where we're going to stick with it for three, five, ten years, but I can only be confident in funding for the first few years. So I think one of the most important things in, in the coming five years, as we see this flourishing of, uh, of philanthropy and a very entrepreneurially driven philanthropy, which I, I think is terrific, I think it's going to be imperative that philanthropists understand the kinds of organizations that they are supporting. They're not for-profit enterprises. And that, 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 that connection between the funder and the nonprofit will be exceedingly important. You, I'm sure, have heard the term social entrepreneurs. It's become, I say, quite an attractive thing for, non for foundations to support. And again, in many cases, the foundations or the funders are people who have been entrepreneurs in the for-profit sector. Again, I, I believe that an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur, whatever sector they're in. They could do anything. An entrepreneur is characterized, again, by some passion about getting something done, moves with some pace and speed, willing to take risks, has high comfort for failure, that, that applies in any context, in any milieu, in any sector. The challenge, however, for a funder who's interested in supporting social entrepreneurs is that the notion of startup capital is very, very different in a not-for-profit setting than it is in a for-profit setting. The for-profit says you're betting on somebody who's going to get to a point where they can spin out a product or a service, something that has demand from buyers. And so the notion of startup is I can get this, I'm going to spin that flywheel by providing some funding. That roughly same philosophy has applied to social entrepreneurs. I'm going to find people who have a great idea who show all of the characteristics and attributes of being a great entrepreneur. They're doing it for a social cause. And I'm going to back that person with startup capital. And what happens is, more often than not, those social entrepreneurs have no other capital coming in. <laughs> I know one funder who puts up $250,000 sort of per entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, over a five-year period of time. With the expectation that within five years or by that five-year horizon, the social entrepreneurs will figure out ways of raising other money. They, they, there aren't that many other sources of funding. Another consequence of that is it's tending to fragment people who are really, really talented when they should be aggregating. So you find people who are self, 
identifying as social entrepreneurs, finding, and there's more and more sources of funding for social entrepreneurs going, is it making the case for me to do this thing? When in fact, they should be aggregating themselves. You say, well, why don't we work together and develop something that can get to critical mass or can have sufficient scale to last forever? And I've seen really, really fine people move out of big nonprofit organizations to become a social entrepreneur because they like the idea of a startup. When I would really encourage them to be a sort of positive deviant within their own organization. I was actually just talking to a funder the other day and asking, <clears throat> have you ever thought about doing that? Finding a big organization, whether it's you know established organization, YMCA, Nature Conservancy, care, you know, that's got an installed, established presence, big resources, but frankly, probably kind of plateaued on the yield curve a little bit. And you see that with big nonprofits. Have you ever thought about funding people in them to be an entrepreneur, as the term used to be, a positive deviant, somebody who could, you know, have the backing of a funder to drive change in a big organization and take advantage of the entrepreneurial characteristics of some individuals, but the resource capacity of a big organization. And I, I haven't seen that yet. I think that, that's a niche for funding in the not-for-profit sector. So as a way to maybe sort of wrap up, and then I'd be very interested in your thoughts and your questions. I think that the world, the, the, the issues, in the, we, we, it's a little trite to say, the world is so interconnected now that the problems are enormously challenging because they are global in so many ways. And yet, because of that, they're also actually tractable. And the not-for-profit sector has become more sophisticated, is getting more sophisticated, is better prepared to take on those tractable problems. At the same time, there is this enormous infusion of wealth going into philanthropy. And so I, I really do look to the not-for-profit sector to step out in front and drive social change. The philanthropists shifting from a sense of charity, we, 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 we bestow a grant on you, we, we provide this this award to you as a charitable beneficiary, as a grantee, even the terminology we use is sort of condescending. Moving from being a charity to drivers of social change, working in true solidarity and collectivity with the organizations they support, so that the combined wealth that is emerging in this country can have far more influence collectively than it will separately, where that solidarity with the supported organizations creates a true sense of partnership and, 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 and not an asymmetrical relationship of funder and grantee. And I really do believe that with the challenges we see in the political arena, with what I see as really an emerging and, 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 and deep-seated understanding in more progressive elements of the for-profit sector, and especially, again, from my background in sustainability, we're seeing more and more big global companies realize that sustainability has a profound bottom line influence. We're seeing investors like Jeremy Grantham from, uh, from Boston starting to point out that if we take the long view in investing, we better be looking at enterprises that are thinking where they're going to get their water, where they're going to get their timber resources, where they're going to get basic commodities 10, 15, 20 years from now. So there's a shift in the wind. And international institutions, um, slow, po politically challenged, not stepping out in front, that there's a chance now for the not-for-profit sector, the philanthropic sector, working in tandem with the business community to take on huge, huge social problems, 
each one bringing something that is unique in terms of its outlook, its resources, and its capabilities to address those problems. And I, I really do think we're on the threshold of a, 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 a very, very exciting new era. But all those sectors will have to step up in ways they never have before, and in ways that sort of put aside, again, their conventional thinking and their orthodoxies, and really try to step out of the mold. And we're, we're seeing, I believe, some of the first signs of that. So I'm very, very, very hopeful. I see in this room people who I'm, conv I'm convinced that in one way or another, every one of you in this room, every one of you who's a student at this school, anyone who's under 25, basically, what I'm saying, <laughs> in 10, 15 years, in one way or another, will be working in some enterprise that is addressing major social change, whether it's a for-profit, government, or not-for-profit. And I, I, I hope in that 10 or 15 years, you will think back and say, you know, the guy McCormick was kind of on the thing. It's like this a very different way of society working together in a VUCA world. So the future is in your hands. Don't, don't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs>
modest donor, if you're giving you know, $50 a year, you're not going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out, is this organization efficient? Um, if you're a big donor like we are, we do a lot of due diligence on the organizations that we support, and we spend a lot of time with them. So I have two observations. One is, as I was in a perhaps a little elliptical way suggesting earlier, nonprofits are inherently inefficient. They're just, the, they're just not efficient. Um, they're, not, they're just not efficient. And unfortunately, there are rating services, actually. Um, GuideStar, Charity Navigator, the Better Business Bureau. They have rating services on the efficiency of nonprofit organizations. And typically what they look at is, what's the percentage of the budget that goes to G overhead and what goes to program? And so you think, well, that's probably a pretty good measure. It's not. And nonprofits figure out how, frankly, how to game that. Um, there are ways you can classify certain expenditures that look like program. It's not, it's not illegal. It's just, you know, in recruiting members, you put out a lot of marketing materials. Is that marketing or is that advertising? I mean, is that is, or, or, or promoting your cause, another way of putting it. Um, so, it's not, frankly, I don't think any of the rating services really give you an insight into efficiency. And in any event, I don't care about efficiency. We, were, I, we support organizations, they're incredibly inefficient. And if I spend a lot of time trying to help them be efficient, it's beside the point. They're incredibly effective. Could they do it at less money? Probably. Is it worth the time to try to make them do that? No. They're incredibly effective. There are no services that give you an insight into the effectiveness of organizations. And I, a, a guy who just uh, left the Hewlett Foundation, who I have great, great respect for, Jacob Harold, has just gone to be the CEO of, uh, of Charity Navigator. Uh, and he, to his credit, is going to try to crack that, that code. How could you create indices or insights into the effectiveness of organizations? But when you think about, again, the, the, the structure of, a, of how a nonprofit organization gets its revenue as opposed to a for-profit. A for-profit has to be constantly <coughs> providing something that somebody wants to buy, either a good or a service. And they can, they can manipulate that, perhaps, by advertising. But still, consumers are making decisions. They're putting money out to get something. If they don't do that, enterprise gone. Nonprofit organization relies on a funder who's not a beneficiary. So the funder is putting money into the organization for that organization to go benefit something. Nature, in the case of the Nature Conservancy. So how do you go ask nature? Is the Nature Conservancy, who's better? The Nature Conservancy, the World Wildlife Fund, or Wildlife Conservation International? It's very, 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 very hard to make that determination. And it requires a lot of time, if you're a donor, to tease behind that. I do think one of the things we're going to see more of, and I think Jacob is at the forefront of that, um, are insights into the effectiveness of organizations, irrespective of their efficiency. Great. Heidi. Kind of a related question um, around compensation. That when you go to a nonprofit, you're sort of presuming that you're taking the value of property. Yeah. And judging how these are rated, right? Salary or overhead, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so it's sort of designed that way. And yet, you know, in Silicon Valley, we recognize that to get the best talent, talent sometimes we have to pay. There are markets for great talent. And I'm just wondering, being in a foundation, so you're not having to constantly pass the donor to us. <coughs> I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your compensation philosophy is and how do you incentivize, besides the great work people know they're doing, right? There are people in Silicon Valley who think they're doing great work yeah. too in for-profits. How, do how do you incentivize your, your staff? Boy, that, that's a really question. How, so how, how do we at the foundation incentivize our staff? In compensation. Is, in it, compensation. is it more like a nonprofit or is it yeah. more like a for-profit? Really good question. Um, when I came to the foundation, um, again, in the spirit of Gordon's desire to create an enterprise that had sort of the best characteristics of a business and a nonprofit, 
we had um, a, a significant incentive pay element. Significant for, I've never seen anything like it in, a, in, in anything other than a for-profit. Um, but it, it doesn't work as well in a not-for-profit organization because, again, you don't, you don't have a convention of metrics. So if I, if I have a sales force, I, 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 over time, can establish pretty good understanding of what, if somebody really puts their, their heart into it, works really hard, um, what a benchmark would be, you know, what I, what I could expect from an annual sales effort. And you'd, I'd reward somebody accordingly. In a foundation, that's really hard because are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve for which we would be rewarded a consequence of what we did or the organization that we support? So that, that's a huge complication. And then it puts, it, 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 it creates a distortion around frankly, near-term things. And it really diminishes a, a push towards risk-taking and experimentation. So we did away with it. Um, I have not seen in any not-for-profit organization, that is not a foundation, but a typical NGO, I've not, there, there are incentive elements to compensation the nowhere near like what we had at our foundation. What we had at our foundation was nowhere near what you would have in a, in a for-profit in terms of the, the proportion of that annual incentive uh, compensation. On the point of compensation overall in nonprofit organizations, it's really, really well taken, Heidi. I think leading a huge global enterprise like CARE is, this is, is as challenging as a huge global enterprise like General Motors, more so in many ways. Um, and yet it is the, it, it is the convention, and it, I, I don't see this changing at all, that nonprofit compensation is a fraction of for-profit compensation. And in fact, the, the, the IRS will even look at whether you know, all, all nonprofits have to file a 990 every year. It's, a, it's, it's basically their tax filing. That 990 has also become a disclosure document. So serving two purposes, and neither one of which is very well, but those 990, everybody looks at the 990s now because they have to show the top five compensated uh, employees. Um, so it's public information, and Congress keeps an eye on that, and the IRS keeps an eye on that. And that gets out into the donor space. And I'll, Share with you when I was at the Nature. This is a whole nother story. This is a whole nother hour story. <laughs> when I was at the Nature Conservancy, <clears throat> um, so here I've been in this. I'd grown up with the Nature Conservancy. Be became president in 2000. When I started, um, <laughs> our media people told me the Washington Post is working on an in-depth story about the Nature Conservancy. I thought. Well, Perfect. I come in as the CEO, do an in-depth story. I'll be the hero. They said, no, you don't understand. This is the investigative unit. <laughs> so what? I mean, we're a great organization. Well, long, 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 very complex story. In 2000, 2001, obviously, other things happened, and we invaded Iraq. This three-part series came out in 2003. And it was like a hit in the solar plexus. It was... Um, it started above the fold on Sunday, which is when they start all their big stories. Went for three days, um, and it led to a congressional Senate uh, Finance Committee investigated us. And it had to do with transactions we'd done with people who had been close to the Nature Conservancy, and the assertion was, you know, we'd crossed the line of ethics, if not crossed the line of the law. But I mean, they they went into everything, including my compensation. And in 2003, I was paid $420,000. And it was like, can you believe McCormick makes four hundred twenty thousand? dollars And I got letters from irate members saying, I can't believe the level of salary. You know, you dedicate yourself. Corporate influence is terrible. 
you know, I just think four hundred twenty thousand dollars is like it's not that much. To, we've got four thousand five hundred people spread around the world and a five hundred million dollar budget I got to raise every year. There's just a big backlash to high levels of compensation, not for profit. Someday that may change. I hope it does. End of story. We were cleared by the Senate Finance Committee after you know two years of rigorous examination. Um, as I say, that's that's a whole other story. As I put out there only to tell that story about the scrutiny of salaries. Um, I, 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 I think it's a real injustice, to tell you the truth. And if we're going to get the caliber of people to go work for nonprofit who have that entrepreneurial orientation and, and desire, um, look, nobody goes to work for a nonprofit for the money, but nobody should really have to sacrifice their personal lives because the levels of compensation are so, so low. And the stress in a, in a nonprofit organization is extraordinarily high. I traveled between 60 and 70 percent of my time when I was president of the Nature Conservancy. I had two little daughters growing up. Um, but you know, you're not going to come out and say that in the light of a Senate investigation. You kind of hit a so, you, you, you hit a sensitive spot there. <laughs> Yes. Building off of that, you talk about how we need to get more people into the social sector and the foundations, but there's a humongous financial incentive against deviating from the Wall Street from the consulting path. Would your foundation be willing to invest in a, a program that works to get more top students from top universities into the social sector? Yeah, it's really a good question. Did you all hear that? Would, no. would our foundation, would found, our foundation or other foundations be willing to invest in <clears throat> ways of bringing people who have the kinds of skills and talents I was describing that I think are necessary, but you know, frankly, understandably, are attracted to working for a McKinsey or in a, in a, in a corporation or a startup. Um, short answer is not, we haven't yet, but I was at dinner last night with some other uh, foundation presidents and we talked about this. Um, we actually had, our foundation, we have six people who came from consulting backgrounds, four of whom were at McKinsey. Um, and these are not people who were rejected by them, but you know who felt that this was a different path they wanted to pursue. So I'm not sure that the con that that we have to actually invest in it. I just I think there are other ways to attract people with those backgrounds um, in, in, into into the not-for-profit sector. We are as a foundation working with some of our major uh, grantees in helping them build leadership. And in those cases, we're actually providing support for them to go hire people who you know frankly wouldn't take the job but for a little higher level of compensation. So we are, we are doing that. I think we are th out of time. <laughs>